All right. Um, Judy Mowit, welcome. I Never Knew TV. All right. It's a pleasure. <laughs> I really am happy to be here with you. And not only with you, but with the people. Yeah. We can't see them, they can't see us, but we are vibing <laughs> with them. We're looking forward to this historical reasoning, right? And uh, before we get into all the history, I heard someone once say they always used to see you jogging on Mona Road. So the question I have for you, is it true you used to jog along Mona Road every morning in Kingston? Yes, because I live close to Mona Road, but I would jog from my house up to the Mona Reservoir. There are so many people that use the reservoir because it's like 1.5 miles. Um, 1.5 mile and four, 1.5 mile and some furlongs, right? So I would, I would drive, I'm not drive, I would walk from a house or jog from a house. That was when I was much younger. I could jog from a house, but, but afterwards I started walking from my house up to the Mona Reservoir. The ambience is beautiful. The mountains is right there. You're looking at the mountains and then the reservoir, the water, you're looking down in the water. So it's a, a beautiful feeling, you know. The trees are the backdrop, you know, so after you finish jogging, you do your exercise and then you relax for a while and then I would walk back down to my home. What year was this around? What year? Yeah. It's many years. It started from in the 1980s, 90s, because I was always that person that loves to you know, exercise and, and keep healthy, you know. So I would do that like every day. And then after, when I got older or when I got um, in my senior years, I would walk to the reservoir and walk around the reservoir. From what I understand, your mother was born in Cuba and moved to Jamaica, right? Um, you were born in Gordon Town, way up in the hills. Your grandmother was a vocalist, and your mother played the keyboard at church. My mother played the keyboard at church. My mother, my grandmother was a singer at home. But when you live up in the hills, if you are singing at home, the whole community can hear you because the wind takes the voice all over. So you don't need a mic, <laughs> you know, it's, it's such a beautiful feeling. And that was what my grandmother brought to me. She was always washing. When she's washing or doing her yard chores, she would be singing. And I think I gravitated to her singing because I loved it, you know. And I, I didn't know that I wanted to be a singer, but I was in love with singing the art and um, when I went into Kingston when I left Garden Town and went into Kingston I went in search of trying to find um, a group a band because I, I wanted to express myself like that Bro, hold on <laughs> before we get to Kingston right I wanted to ask like did your mother tell you who taught her how to play the keyboards? Okay. My mother was a teenager when she had us, but she attended the Roman Catholic Church when she was a little girl, and they taught her to play the keyboards. She also played the accordion. She played the accordion too? Yes, yes. But when she got pregnant, she was, um, she couldn't be in the church anymore. You know, their custom, their policy was that you can't be pregnant and not married. So. Oh, so she got like banished from the church almost? She got banned. That's wild. <laughs> yes. Yeah, wild. yeah. I thought, I understand, but I thought you would more embrace somebody and give them support that is and what kick them out. I think, and that is what should be, you know, 
um, there are some churches would put you in the back bench, which is wrong. You are a human being and you need to be embraced. You need to be loved. That is a time when you need to be, 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 be cared for in a special way. That love that you experience, the love of the church. But she was um, put out because she was pregnant and not married. All right. So um, also with your mother, right? I did hear you say that um, she wasn't the most affectionate person, <laughs> right? No. And I just want to know, like, how did that lack of affection impact you and your relationships with others in retrospect now reflecting on your life? Okay. I understand why my mother was not affectionate because she never got any affection herself. And if love and affection is not poured in you when in your formative years, in your early years, then you grow with that void. And I found that when my sister and I would go, when there's a moment that we say, yes, let us try to reach her now, when we would go to her, and wanting to just get a hug. There was, she wasn't there for us. She, she pushed us away, you know, and I, I understand now that she herself needed love. She herself was not taught. She herself was not given. So how are you gonna give something that you have never been given? You know, and, and that is it. I understand clearly where my mother was coming from she was a teenager. She never experienced love from her mother and from her father. Her father was not even around. My grandmother went to Cuba and when things got, there was a time when the Caribbean, the people from the Caribbean who went to Cuba, when things were going good, they had jobs over there. And when things went bad, um, Caribbean people were going back home. And so my grandfather, my mother's father, had to return to his country. He couldn't take my mother because, my grandmother, because he was poor. And my grandmother could not do the same for him. So they parted right there and he went home and my grandmother came home with my mother. But she had to work, my mother, came home with her, with her mother. And so my grandmother had to work to take care of her. And my mother started having children very, very early. And they were like one behind the other. And I came, I think when she was 17 years old. So having these children to look after and not having any love, I can imagine how difficult it was for her. And um, as I say, my sister and I would go for affection and love, but there was none. She would push us off. Okay. So what it did for me when I became a teenager, I looked for love in the wrong places. So I looked for love in the wrong places. I was searching so much for love and I would give anything just to receive what is called love, because <clears throat> I don't know what love, I didn't know what love is at that time. And so I mistaken love for some men looking lost in after me. I thought that was love, you know, so I, I gravitated to that. And that was when I got into serious trouble and realized that that was not love. And I recognize there is no way you can experience love or you can give love without love being poured into you. You know, so it was later on in life I discovered that I had a problem, not loving and not able to find love. And until I found Christ, I realized that was the love that I needed. And that was the love that has drawn me 
into love. So I can love others now without others who are loveless, others who sometimes would hurt you. I can still love them because of this love that is within me, this Christ love that has been deposited in my heart. What was the work situation in Gordon Town? Because like Gordon Town's way up there on a hill. And I know people not going to Kingston every day to work. So what's the occupation like? What's the survival like up there? I was wondering. Survival. Um, the staple, the, the men farmed. You know, um, women would stay home and care for the children. And men would work the farm, sell the produce, and allow that produce to share for their family and to really sell, to bring, to build their, their homes, send their children to school and whatever. Were, were there particular crops they focused on up there or? Chocolate. Chocolate and coffee. You're up on the mountain, that makes sense then. All right. Yes, but I was all the way up in the mountain. The coffee is grown in the mountains. The chocolate is grown on the lower, the lower part of the, 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 um, the village. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that history. So um, you leave Gordon Town and you go to Kingston, right? Was that a culture shock for you going to the Kingston environment from Gordon Town? It was a culture shock because Kingston was much faster. Um, I went to school. I went to school in Kingston. But prior to that, I went to Hanover. I left Gordon Town and I went to Hanover. And in Hanover, I learned to farm. Is Hanover slower than Gordon Town? Hanover is, um, it's slower. Yeah, it's country country. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it's down in the valley. <laughs> it's, it's down in the valley. But what I noticed there was a camaraderie with people. They were very close. In the mornings, people would come to my uncle's yard. They would drink coffee, because they grew coffee down there too. They would drink coffee. They would discuss what is going on in the community and um, we had a lot of people apart from my grandmother where I was living in Garden Town there was a lot of people but these were community people that came together we farmed a lot but the farmers in the community if you are going to be farming yam the other farmers from the area would come and give you a hand, clean out the land, and um, put in the yam sticks, you know, and planting. And when it's time to clean the area, the farmers would come and they would help. And when it's time to harvest, the farmers would come and they would help. Nobody paid anybody any money, because when it's your turn, all the farmers come again together to help you. So some real collective security type Collective vibe. security for surety. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm glad you shared that with us. All right, you go yeah. to Hanover, right? You're exposed to farming. So you went from Gordon Town, Hanover, then you go to Kingston. Then I went to Kingston. All right, what was the decision to leave Hanover to go to Kingston? Well, I was not in Hanover for, it was not a permanent situation. I went there because of a certain situation at home. And I spent a year, I went to school, <laughs> I went to school for that year, and I experienced a lot. What I loved about Hanover was the rivers. You know, we had a river at the bottom of our land, and we would catch fish that those experiences were awesome. You know, we would catch fish, and we would cook our own pot, down there when we catch the fish 
our ackees in season, we would dig our own yam, we would cut our own bananas, self-sufficient, you know. And um, as children, I learned all of that and I really enjoyed it. So as a woman, even where I'm living, I'm living in St. Andrew, but it's as if I take the country to town. Same type of energy. Yes, because I plant the bananas, pineapples, produce, um, seasoning. If I want thyme or if, you know, if I want something, I could go in my backyard and just take it to the kitchen. <laughs> yes. You mentioned you were looking for a group or anything to get into music, but you were dancing, right? Yeah. So what's up with the dancing? Like, when did you get when did you get into this dancing vibe? Uh, all right. I wanted to get into music, but I didn't have an inroad. I didn't know how to get into the music. I really wanted to sing, but I didn't know how what avenue to take. And so I saw where you had Every night you had live music at different nightclubs. That was what was happening. So I was thinking if I could talk to some of these um, managers or promoters to see if I could you know, get an opportunity to sing at these nightclubs. But it wasn't working, so I say, you know what? I'm gonna get into dancing. And there was a group called the Estrelita Dancers. And I wanted to join long ago, but I could not find the people who manages the dance troupe. And finally, I found them. And I was drawn in, and I was a very good dancer. <laughs> I was a very good dancer because I was using that now as an inroad into the music. And I got an opportunity um, night after night when we dance, they would allow me to sing like a one song. And with that one song, they would give me another opportunity to sing another song. Do you remember what song you would sing during that time? Island songs. I was singing like um, songs that Harry Belafonte would sing. They all, you know, um, this is my island in the sun, that type of energy. I started singing those songs. And I even toured with the group. We went to Grand Cayman and um, did very well. Were you, were, what was the pay like? Were you getting paid? No pay. No pay, all right. No pay. That's why I asked, because I always hear people say they weren't getting paid. No pay. No pay, but you are so, you're so appreciative of the opportunity to be doing what you're doing. Pay to me was not, was not important. In those days, money was not the issue. Yet, you needed money. But just to hear your voice on the radio, just to know that you are dancing and you're making people, happy, you're entertaining. I mean, that was enough for me. Um, and then after dancing, then I got an opportunity now to sing with a group called the Galets. The Galets was already in existence, but they needed a lead singer. And so where I, where I used to rehearse, dan do dance rehearsal, there was a sister there, Beryl Lawson, who was a cashier at the Baby Grand Club. It was the Baby Grand Club. And so um, the people for the dance troupe, we would rehearse there. And so they asked Beryl to be a part of the dance troupe. So she became a member of the dance troupe. And then we would chit chat. And she told me that she was a member of this group. And she wanted to reinstate the group. And she wanted, she wouldn't mind if I could.
could lead a group because um, they heard me singing after rehearsals in the bathroom and you would be doing some of your bathroom songs and she heard, you know, and we became very good friends and so we reestablished the group. Um, her and another sister, Merle Clemenson, they were the two former members of the group. And so um, Federal Records heard of us. There was this brother, Henry Buckley. Henry Buckley was a writer. And I was just happening, I just happened to pass his gate. I'm living on Jake's Road in Mountain View. And I'm walking down Jake's Road and I heard like somebody playing a guitar. So because I'm musically inclined and anything to do with music, I want to see who is playing this guitar. So I knocked on the gate and this gentleman came out. And I said, you playing the guitar? And he said, yes. And he said, if I want, I could come in. So I went in and he told me that he's a songwriter. And he wrote the song, Silent River. I was gonna ask you about the big hit, but well, go ahead. He, he wrote the song, Silent River, yeah. Runs Deep, and I Like Your World, and many other songs that the Gaelets did. And he was, he was a recording artist himself. And so he introduced us to Federal Records. That's how the relationship started with Federal Records. Right, that's where it started. Um, first time in the studio at Federal Records, right? How intimidating was that for you? Bad. It was devastating <laughs> because I didn't know it was so much that it took out of you. This is why some people take drugs. You know, it, it took so much, you have so many eyes looking at you and telling you what to do and you really don't know what to do and sometimes they are not friendly. You know, they, they intimidate you. It's sometimes it becomes intimidating. And it was hard, but we got over it. I got over it. I have a question, right? So when you went to Federal Records, did you record on a track or you had to record with the band? You record with the band. All right. The question I have now is that because I believe, if I, I don't know if Alton Ellis told me this, right? But he was telling me that like sometimes the band is playing on a key that you can't get to. Have you experienced that? Like they, your voice is here, but they're playing here. Yes. And that's really a discomfort and it will throw you off off balance because if the band is playing in one key and you are singing in one key that's total confusion the band and the singer must be on one accord because he was telling me they basically just want to get people in and out especially if you're you're not a big artist they just want to get you in and out the studio yes yes and sometimes they don't have any patience. Like when I started at Federal, I never experienced them having patience with me. They wanted to get it. And I am doing this thing for the first time. And they wanted to sing it a certain way. And if you don't sing it a certain way, they will even shout at you. You know, and that- At the females? Yeah, they'll shout at you. They'll shout at you. Some people are, have an arrogant mentality. Some people are calm and peaceful and they get the best out of you when they are being calm and they can walk you through what they want you to do. But when they shout, that creates a certain nerve. Throw off the vibe. Throw off the vibe. And, but those are some of the growing pains and pangs that I had to go through. All right, gay lads, gay lads, they had a massive hit, right? But two of the members leave, they go back to, they go to America, you're there, you stay there, right? Right. How hard was that period of your life when they left? Because you were part of a group and had some success and now you're kind of like by yourself again. I was pregnant yeah. and um, I wanted to stay back in Jamaica 
to have my child. They wanted me to come to America. They got an opportunity to come to America. And um, I didn't want to come. I want to stay back. And so it was very difficult. It was hard for me. I wasn't really earning as I used to. And at that time, I mean, God has always been good to me. That was where Mrs. Sonia Pottinger from Tip Top Record. I admire this lady and I always wanted to get an opportunity to work with her and for her. But I didn't want to just go and let her know that I needed to work. And she, in those days, you never had telephone. So you had to send messages. So she sent me a message to say she wants to see me. And when I went to see her, she told me that she had a rhythm that she wanted me to sing a song on. And that was I Shall Sing. It was a song originally done by Miriam Makiba. Yeah. And I was able to do the song. And that was where it all started for Judy Mowat. All right. Uh, before we go forward with Judy Mowat, right? We need to talk about Julian Mowat. Julian Mowat. Julian Mowat, right? <laughs> so <laughs> you we, have a lot of history. We're going to get into the history here, right? Um, I know it was some mix-up at Federal Records, but before we get there, I just want to make sure, were they actually giving artists etiquette lessons and voice training at Federal Le Records? That's a lie. They weren't giving it? They weren't. All right, I just want to make sure I clear that history up. That's a lie. Um, as a young girl, they wanted me to sign a contract separate and apart from the group. And so this lady, Mrs. Curry, she brought like a book. It's a contract, but it looks like a book. And what she was naming the terms and her terms sounded real good. You know, she was not allowing me to read. Plus I had no legal tutoring, no understanding about legal affairs. So I had no legal understanding. And so whatever they told me, I would just take that, you know, as, as, as truth, believing and not expecting any lies, you know. And um, she said, okay, we are going to send you to do voice training. We're going to allow you to do choreography. We're going to allow you to do, to learn mic techniques and all of that. And that sounded real good because I wouldn't have any other way. I wanted to do all of that, but I had no money and no way. And so she said, she's going to do all of that. And I signed the contract. There were a lot of other things offered. And I went ahead and I signed the contract based on what I was told. Only to find out that the contract was perpetual. It was forever. <laughs> forever. And it renew itself every three months. So here's a contract that I have no control over and it renews itself every three years, not three months, every three years. So there was a group that they were recording. And at the time, they had taken me now from the two girls, the Gaelets, and they started to record me. And they thought I would have been this big hit. And it never happened. So they got a group from America and they were recording them. So what they did with me, they put me on the shelf. Yeah. So there was no way I can record because I have this contract over my head. I can't go and record for anybody. So I cannot do anything. My career would have ended 
where it started. And I was on the shelf doing nothing, looking to do other things, get into another career. I wanted to be a nurse, you know, but I never had the money to even go and um, do the, the classes, to do the subjects that you needed to get into nursing. Not knowing that music, the power of music, is making me a nurse to nurse the souls of people, the sick souls of people, people who need love, people who need affection, people who are going through trials and tribulation, and there is a song that relates to a human situation. You know, there's always a song, and this is why singers should be careful what they sing, what they put on the vinyl, what they put on tape, what they, what they do, because it's reaching out to people that needs changes in their lives, and you should be that one to take them out of the situation they are in and to put them at a place where they can find peace, love, joy. That's what music is all about. That when I came into music, that's what I gravitated from those who were before me. You know, that joy, you know, you could dance, you're happy, you know, and plus it's all so deep because it brings you to a level of consciousness. It brings you to a level of consciousness and awareness of who you are. You know, that's what music does. Like for Bob Marley, Bob Marley would, his music will tell you your background, who you're from and where you're from, who you are. You are from African descent. Nobody's going to tell you that. You know, so as Bob said again, music is going to teach you a lesson. Music is teaching information. You know, let me go back to where I was. A segue because I wanted to make that point. <laughs> no, we got you, we got you. Yeah. But where I was. Oh, you were breaking down. Uh, I want to know about the name change because you changed your name for a while to record. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Mrs. Sonia Pottinger, remember I tell you, she called me. But no, I need a name because Judy Mowat is signed perpetually to Federal Records. So there is no way I can use Judy Mowat name out there. And um, there was Lee Scratch Perry, who was at Mrs. Pottinger's. She had a record shop down Orange Street, and he was there the day, and we were talking about ah the controversy with the, the contract signing and how to get out of it. And he said, why don't you change your name? And Mrs. Spotting just you know, looked as if it was a good idea. And he said, call your name Julian. OK, close to Judy, call your name Julian. But the thing is, after I started recording on the Tip Top label as Julian, it was difficult now because when I go on stage to perform, I have a problem. The people know me as Judy. So I was singing Julian songs. But people not knowing that is not two different people, it's one and the same. So that created another problem, you know. And um, it took a while, but finally I got out of the contract. I got a lawyer and I got out of the contract. Coxon died, right? So it seemed uh, you got some backup work at Studio One, and that's how you met Marcy and Where Rita you Marley. get them information right, That's from. what I do, though. I'm just telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Your research. This is what I do. I research, You're a researcher. Right? Yeah, yeah. So this is what I do, right? So... Do you remember the song you were recording at Studio One when you met Marcia Griffiths and Rita Marley? I don't remember the song, but it was a Horace Andy song. It was a Horace Andy song. We were, 
to tell you the truth, Cox and Dodd asked me to come to the studio to sing with some other people, two other people, but I didn't know who they were. And when I got to the studio, I mean, I think it's my first time being close to Marcia. I was gonna ask how was that? Because she was a big deal at the and time. And being then, right? close to Rita. Yeah. But nobody knew that in my heart these two people were my favorite. Look at that. My favorite singers. And I was wondering and wishing and hoping that one day I would meet them, but I didn't know that my wishes would come true. And it, it came true right there in Mr. Dodd's studio. And I, I didn't know what to say to them. I didn't know what to say. I was just in awe all by myself. I wanted to pinch myself because this is a reality that I always hoped for and dreamed about. The chemistry was excellent. From the start. From the start. It wasn't like, oh, she's singing that and it doesn't blend with me, or Rita singing that it does. The blend was accurate. It was an accurate blend. And we finished so quickly. And um, Marcia said she has a concert at a club call. Uh, and no, it's on Knutsford Boulevard. I don't remember the name of the club right now. But she had a concert that night at the club. And she said, why don't you and Judy come and, you know, come sing a song with me? Um, we all love the Supremes because the Supremes were reigning during that period. And Marcia loved the Supremes, Rita loved, I loved the Supremes. And so she was doing a Supreme song that she wanted us, she called us up on stage. And we went up and the audience was so delighted with the song that we did. Um, in Jamaica at that time, the Gleaner, if anywhere the concert is, the Gleaner company would send a reporter and a photographer. And the photographer and the reporter was there. So the very next day, it was in the Gleaner. So hold on, how was that you, how did you feel being in the Gleaner next to artists that you looked up to? What? I was overjoyed, I was beside myself. I was happy because what I desired, it's right here now, it's, I'm living it. And um, it's not that we just did that one, one thing and it was over. We became friends and people heard us working together because we did some songs with Bob Andy and we did. Hold on, we gotta get this history. What songs did you do for Bob Andy? Look here, I, that was a long ago. Oh man, right, I right, remember right. the moment, yeah. but I don't remember the song. All right, before we check it, I think it's Check It Out. Check a it song out. named Check It Out. All right, uh, since you brought up Bob Andy real quick, would you consider Bob Andy one of Jamaica's greatest songwriters? Excellent, he was. He was a great songwriter, greater than how he, he sang, you know. He was, I mean, when you listen to some of those songs that he has written, I mean, it's deep. Very it's deep, you know? It's very, very deep. <laughs> very deep. And again, I said, it relate. You see, songs must relate to you and your situation and your life. And when a man can go into your life, maybe it's his life, and this is why our situations are some most times similar. Although we look alike, or we don't look alike, but our situations in life are most times similar, you know? So, um, yeah. So I think we did that song Check it out. All right. And I need to clear up some history, right? First one is, did Bunny Whaler give you the name, the I-3s? <laughs> uh, 
Um, Marcia. Marcia was there the evening. We were at Harry J's studio and we were doing some background vocals for Bob. This is the time now that Bob and Bonnie and Peter split. And we now, we were introduced to be doing the background vocals for Bob. Before we get to Bob, did you record a song for Big U prior to that? Mm, background vocals. Background. Was it Every Nigga is a Star? I think so. Was that the first song you guys recorded as a group? Recorded now, not performed. Recorded as a group. I don't remember. No, all right. I just want to clear up because I yeah. don't remember. I've heard it said before. I heard it said too. I just want to you clear up. Yeah. And um, I don't want to say no and then him say, but she's a liar. <laughs> you know, yeah, I don't. That, that. So I, that. I don't remember. All right. But um, yes. So Bonnie was there the evening and he was saying, what are you guys going to name yourself? What are you going to call yourself? And uh, um, Marcia said, we three, we could call ourselves we three. And then um, Bonnie Wheeler said, no, ja the eye in the tree. So calling herself, I three, but Marcia is reminding me that it was not Bonnie Wheeler, it was her who said I three. She said we three, and then she said I three. First tune you recorded with Bob Marley was Jalive as the I threes? Yes. That's like an intense song to record for your first song, right? It's an intense song. It was an answer to um when it was said that his majesty died, there was news in Jamaica, in the West, that his majesty had died. And Bob was responding to that news per se. And um, it was Jalive. And uh, yes, that... Or any uh, musicians, or were you reluctant? Anyone reluctant, like anyone didn't want to record the song? No. All right. We sure. all wanted to record it. Because at the time, I was a Rastafarian. And I wanted to stand up behind those lyrical contents that says, Jalive, you know. And we all, we all stood up musicians, background vocals, Bob, we just um, supported, supported what was said, what was said in the song. I want to talk about this powerful, powerful song, Down in the Valley, right? <laughs> and it has some history you know about. Um, from what I understand, Down in the Valley is supposed to be about Patrice Lumumba? Yes. All right. But uh, I think it's, it's an important song to you also because that's the song you used to rehearse with Bob Marley and Rita Marley all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. Question I have is why didn't Bob Marley ever record that song? I don't know why, but Bob had Rita and I rehearsing that song. I remember there was a time in my life when I would finish my chores and I would head down to Trenchtown to see Rita and to just rehearse with Bob. And every evening it would be that one song. There wasn't another song. We knew the song like the back of our hands. And I realized I, I loved the song. I knew the song so well. And I loved the song. And when I decided to do <clears throat> my Black Woman album, I decided to put that song on it. Can you tell us a story like why you started to cite up Rastafari and why you ended up joining 12 tribes? <laughs> okay. I, as I said before, I did not have love 
in my heart. I grew up like a loveless soul, you know, trying to gravitate to love wherever I can find it. And I remember one evening, there was a brother from 12 Tribe. Alan Cole and I, we were driving and we saw this brother on the road. He knew the brother, I didn't know him. And when the brother was leaving, they were talking and when the brother was leaving, he said, he said, one love. He said, one love. Um, and something in me just pulled me to what he said. It was something that I needed. And the brother said it with such sincerity. One love. And that was what I was searching for. And when he said one love, this thing just enveloped me. And um, somehow, that brother was a member of 12 Tribe. And Alan, Alan was my children's father. Or he is <laughs> my children's father. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we heard about 12 Tribe having a meeting down in um, Trenchtown. And I wanted to go because this brother that I heard him say, one love. I wanted to see more. I wanted to feel more. I want to see what this love, one love entailed. So it was Alan's birthday and I had a surprise party. He never knew about the party. Whole heap of food, whatever. And we went to Trenchtown. And it so happened that we went and they had a meeting and they were talking and we signed up that night to be members of the 12 tribe of Israel. So much so that when we got back home, all the people who were invited to the party left. It was just the, 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 the music, it's just the music man playing. So at that meeting, was Prophet God there? I know it was some other representative. He was there. Yeah. He was there. Was he like a great speaker or something, or was, what was his story? He's very charismatic, right. influential. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. And I was just searching for this thing, and I felt comfortable. I felt that there was, there was where I needed to be at that time. Yeah. And uh, why did 12 Tribes attract so much of the top artists at the time? It's like all the top artists in Jamaica were members of 12 Tribes during that time. Yeah, but even Bob Marley. Yeah. Bob. I guess it's the message. The message was, as I say, love most of all. But its main theme was back to Africa was back to Africa and um, they were sending people from Jamaica to Shashamani. You know, you pay your dues and that money um, was able to purchase a ticket for like an individual. And so they have sent several members to Africa. All right, and uh, also too, I know a lot about 12 tribe history, right? Seemed like it was a rise and a fall. Why do you, why do you think like it declined so quickly? Because it seemed like it was at a, a height. All organizations have their problems, right? But twelve tribes seem to just like have a swift decline. Why do you think, in your eyes? I asked many people this, and I heard different theories. Why do you think it like declined so much as an organization? Well, as an organization, there's always a leader. There's always a leader, an organization must have a leader. And Prophet Gad was the leader of the organization. 
and Prophet God passed, he died. And I think it is during that time there was this decline. Because as I say, he was very charismatic and he pulled, attract people, you know. And um, he passed on. Some people left, some people stayed, you know. And uh, during your time, trying to rise the fire over two decades from what I understand, right? I heard a lot of horror stories from the men in regards to uh, abuses and imprisonment. Were women also being abused who were trying to rise the fire at that time or did they leave the women alone? What kind of abuse? Like police brutality, police brutality and getting locked up. Oh yes, because Rastas were hated. Rastas were hated. Rastas would be beaten for nothing at all, you know, just because of what they stand for, you know. And um, I remember even myself going into a taxi and heading down to Trenchtown. This driver, he was sitting face in his cab, face not looking behind to see who was coming in the cab. And when he looked around and saw me and saw that I was a Rasta, he told me to come out of his car. You know, we were ostracized. We were hated, you know. We were not a part of society. We were not part and parcel of society. They plant their own food, they do their own fishing. They were self-sufficient somewhat, you know. Um, and you find that people didn't like that. People, and, and they born Babylon, you know. Whatever the, the system, whatever the system, the social system were demonstrating, Rasta was not involved. As Bob say, um, Rasta no work for no CIA. CIA. Rasta no mix up in a CSA yeah. and them no work for CIA. You know, so it was like a group of people all by themselves and we stayed by ourselves. We never mixed with the broader society, you know. And um, when we saw that mixture, it, it became so watered down now because um, you find that society, members of society were coming in and they never had the, 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 the customs that, you know, we maintain. It wasn't that anymore. It wasn't, it wasn't about the doctrines anymore. It was something lighter and more frivolous, you know, so. Um, it, it just, I wouldn't say it peter out because they are still functioning. And um, I really respect them because they were there when I needed them, you know, but our spirits dictate what we do. Our spirit, when you, when you need to move from one level or your journey doesn't stop, but it has certain stops where you, like you're on a train and you come off at a certain stop and the train goes on. I find in my life now that I started to ponder my life. I started to look into my life for all the things that I agreed with and all the things that I was living. I never enjoyed it anymore. What were some of those things? Like, what caused that inner conflict within you where you say, you know what, I'm gonna stop trying to rise the fire and, and, and deal with the Christianity? It's just a, a consciousness. 
inside of me where I was caught, I was questioning and I needed more answers. There were more questions than answers. I was questioning, was this right? You know, because then people saw his imperial majesty as the return messiah, right? And I questioned that his imperial majesty um, is 1892, I think he was born. I don't even want to say it because I'm not sure. But at the time where he was born, Christ was before that, long ago. So when I started to question myself and asking myself, what so is so? Why do you believe that I could not give myself a valid answer, you know? And I, I started, well, I was reading the Bible, but in reading the Bible, His Majesty said that he has found the truth for himself. And inside of the Bible, for truth, you read it and you will find the truth for yourself. And I realized that even in my walk, I was more allowing people to dictate to me and tell me what is instead of investigating for myself. And when I started to investigate, I realized that. Things were adding up to you. Uh-uh. All right. You, had, you seem like you had some hard transitional periods in your life, right? And it seems to be another one now because you're, uh, you're a part of a group with a person who's the face of Rastafari across the world. You're a member of 12 Tribe, and you're just in that scene. How did your peers respond when you made that decision to move on with your life? My parents? Peers. Oh. You mean? Friend group. Yeah, I yeah. understand yeah. you, but um, as a Rasta or as a Christian? Yeah, when you, when you decided to leave Rastafari and Oh, God. It was not easy. Did they burn you out? Oh, God, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, yes. It, it was a, I wouldn't say a horrible period, but it was a period that I realized that the love that I thought I received and the love, this love had to be proven, you know, because when I get these burnout and, you know, I had to have something in me not to fight back, but to know that I must, there, there was this, there was this strength that I gathered in my life that it doesn't matter what you say or what you do, I'm not gonna be afraid because this is what I desire. This is what my spirit is, 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 is pushing me, driving me to do and I would not allow nothing. You'd have to kill me, but nothing was gonna stop me because I believe now I found what I was searching for. All this time as a child coming up, this is what I searched for. So you found that solace and peace I in Christianity. I found that peace and that solace in Christ. All right, why do you believe Bob Marley looked up to Skill Cole so much? Why I think Bob Marley looked up to skill. Skill was an international footballer. Skill went to Brazil and played professional football. And he was respected by all Jamaica. All of Jamaica respected him. And I think that was what gravitated, that was what caused Bob to gravitate, gravitate to skill. Um, skill was a friend to Bob. Skill was a manager. In those early days, 
He was Bob's manager. He was Bob's confidant. I mean, I remember the days when Skill and Bob jogging on the sand in Bull Bay and, and um, jogging, cooking. I know that Skill was the person that is always introducing nutrition, proper nutrition as a footballer to footballers and also to Bob and to the musicians, to all of us. And um, I think that there was a synergy, there was a chemistry between he and Bob. Um, I remember going to rehearsals. I mean, I am going to rehearse. And I would see skill at the rehearsal. Bob Marley is on the show, but I don't see Bob at the rehearsal. And then the musician would just call Alan and they start playing the songs. And Alan, I know Alan cannot sing, but Alan is the one that is rehearsing the songs for Bob. So there were so many things that Alan was to Bob that I know that there was a love between both of them, you know, because it, it was not even something where Alan, because I heard Alan say it recently, say he was the only one that Bob never had on a payroll. He never paid him, he never wanted nothing with all that Alan was doing for Bob. He never wanted any money because I think the relationship was more important. It was a lasting, genuine relationship and they loved each other. They loved each other, they smoked together, they eat together, everything they did together, you know, everything that was positive, they did together. So I think there was a great love and respect for each other. From what I understand, your Black Woman album was the first album recorded at Tough Gong Studio, right? Mm -hmm. All right, how did the book To Be a Slave by Julius Lester influence the lyrics of the songs on the Black Woman album? Okay, God has a way when he wants something to be manifested, he has a way how he wants it done. I came upon this book by Julius Lester. It's called To Be a Slave. And I was reading that book. I was reading that book at the time while I was, um, when, I, when I began recording the Black Woman album, I was reading that book. And it was talking about slaves, especially the women, how they would lose their children, how they would have to um, walk on ice, even in the winter, when they take them from like the, the South, Kentucky, and they are going to another country, another state rather. They are going to another state and they would be walking on the ice and their foot bottom would split open and they would be bleeding and there was no, 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 no heart. There was nobody to, um, well, just being sorry for them. That was just their life. Our four mothers, our aunts, that was what happened to them. Their children were taken from them and sold to different slave masters. And I was so engrossed in the book. I was so engrossed with the book. I was deeply, like I was a part of it. I could probably tell you how it feel because I put myself in it. 
I would be on the bus driving I miss my stop or I am in tears I have to come off the bus you know that was what it did to me and what happened I became pregnant with the contents of the book and with that I was writing it was easy to write the songs and black woman the song black woman came out of that experience came out of reading that book you know so although it was like a a horror a horrible experience but something good came out of it for me the black woman album and how did you balance because obviously i know you had a very rigorous rehearsal schedule and you had a very rigorous touring schedule so how did it work out for you to get in the studio and record these songs? Well, I would, um, whenever I am not on tour, when I'm not on tour, I would um, go in the studio and I would record these songs. But I don't know, there was such a drive, a passion, that I had that one day, although I'm working with Bob, one day I'm going to be doing my own. And this was a preparation. So each time I come off tour, I would go in the studio and I would probably record three or four songs. And then I would go back on tour, you know, to record again. Um, and I remember telling you that I did, when the song was when the album was finally, um, when it was done, I didn't know what to do now. I didn't have a company to give it to. I didn't know which company to approach. I didn't know anything about that. And um, it was Shanaki Records that they sent, they sent to ask me if um, I want to do a distribution deal with them for, the, for North America. And yes, I did that. And <laughs> I want to tell you, it's as if I went right back into the same federal records. Or oh, the mix up with the contract. Situ situation. Ah, but... Um, Yes. So the deal with them, was it a, a multi-album deal or what? No, it was a distribution deal to distribute the album in North America. But when it was expired, it was for seven years. And when it was expired, I never got it back. I never got it back. So, it's more to it, but I won't say anything more right now. I got you, I got you, I got you. Yeah. How much did being around Bob Marley impact your approach to music and the work ethic you had towards your work? Working with Bob, I was able to stand in the background and watch him and watch how, you know, this man, how he has written his songs and I, I saw I saw Bob had a same Bob had a passion that he must what I was noticing I was saying but this man he doesn't take a break he's always creating another song He's always recording another album, but it's as if he, something was driving him that he had to complete everything at a particular time. He, he never took a break. The only break you would see Bob would take is playing football, you know? But I, I never saw him going out shopping, you know what I mean? <laughs> I never saw that people would go shopping and whatever. Bob would be always creating, 
creating music and he had a discipline. Discipline, it must finish, this must complete at a particular time, this must be released at a particular time. But I think what Bob was doing in his mind was preparing his legacy for generations and generations to come. So he never wasted time. I never saw him waste time. I never saw him gallivanting. You know, he was always in the music. We come off, we are on tour, and we would come off the stage, get in the bus, get to the hotel. As soon as everybody is in their comfortable clothes, we have to go to Bob's room, musician and all, to rehearse to rehearse some upcoming songs, some songs that has not been recorded as yet. It was always, so when you saw that, you see that time in time for him was, was um, time was at stake, time, because to me, he had to complete and finish his work at a particular time. How rough was tour life back then? Because it's a bus across Europe you're dealing with, right? Yeah. How rough was those? How rough were those tours on the body? It took a toll, but let me tell you something. What I learned from Bob, and I think what Bob learned from Alan, was that you have to stay. Your body have to stay fit. So you have to continuously exercise. When we would um, say, for instance. We would fly from a three month tour in America and we landed in Europe. The first thing we look for is a park. Where can we find a park? Because we need to run. We need to jog. We need to get this air out of our lungs, you know, and, and refresh our lungs with fresh air. Um, we eat properly, you know, and there was, when you look at the, table. The table had everything that was nutritionally right. All the vitamins. The table had laid out with vitamins, laid out with um, fruits and vegetables, you know, all the things that to maintain the structure. It was there. So that I think is what kept us and also our belief that we were on a mission. We were not ordinary people out there on a tour, um, allowing people to dance. The music wasn't dance music. The music was teaching, was information, and, 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 and um, education, you know? So um, it was, us focusing on the Bible. We read our Bible, we ate well, so we had the spiritual. We were growing spiritually. And that was what Bob was giving to the people. Because I believe what Bob was doing was not something that anybody could just get up and do. He was moved by the Spirit of God to do what he's doing, to do what he did. And I also believe, I also have heard like prophets from the United States come to Jamaica and they would say that Bob was a prophet. Bob was a prophet sent from God. You know, because a lot of things when you listen to his prophetic declaration in his music, they come to pass. If you look at what is happening now, there's a natural mystic, you know, in the ear. And if you listen carefully, this may be the first trumpet, this may be the last, but many more is gonna suffer, many more is gonna die. And when we read the Bible, there's a lot of things that are going to come up on this earth where the Bible tells us that, and we are in that time now, where earthquake in diverse places, 
and we are seeing so many earthquakes all over the world. You know, famine, famine. Um, there are some countries now that people can't find food to eat. Exactly. And people just have to read the Bible for themselves because His Majesty, His Majesty told us that in the Bible, we will find the truth for ourselves. And we should read the Bible. And I think that was one of the greatest things that he could have said, because in the Bible, he says, you will find the truth for yourself. Men sees their hopes and aspiration crumbling before them. And they don't know where to go. We are in that time now. They don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. They don't know who to look to. But the Bible, he says, in the Bible, we will find the truth. I want to talk about your work at Jamaica's Fort Augustus Women's Prison, right? How did that start, and what were you doing with the women there? Um, Fort Augusta Women's Prison. I recognize that the women at Fort Augusta were not only Jamaican women, but they were women who um, came, from, came from England and different parts of Europe, you know, Caucasian women. Yeah, white women in there? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, man. And um, imagine these people are from so far away from family, away from their family, away from their loved ones, not having anybody to embrace them. And so I figured that going in there and sharing motivational talk, you know, with them, take like toiletries for these women. And there were times when I had even um, like a day where we have music, gospel music, grace thrillers. And, grace and, thrillers. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'll say the grace thrillers. Grace thrillers and other, um, I think Papa San, Papa San was one of them. And we, we, we take musicians in. And so we would give them a day. Yes. To strengthen, to strengthen them. Because everybody, everybody's just down. And, and if you're not careful, they will lose their minds thinking I'm home or whatever. And so we, I recognized that. And so we would go in and share, just talk, just talk with them and hear what is on their minds and, and love them, love them. Because I'm careful with this, call, this thing called love, you know. I'm very careful because remember I said, I never got any. And I know that there are so many people out there that has not experience love. And this is why our world is the way it is, because there is so little, it's lacking of love. So when we can take time out of our busy schedule and, and love on somebody, it's so important. It brings the best, because love is the greatest and love is the best, yeah. And what do you think, like, what pushed you to do that work? Because you could be doing many other things with your time. What do you think pushed you to do that type of work? It's the spirit in me. It's the spirit of God. It is the spirit of God. Um, all right. Let me just say this. I am also, I have a breakfast program in Bath, St. Thomas. And I've... I've been there from 2001 and 2011. 2001, um, we helped the people with hardware material. I would go around and beg 
actually big, you know, for roofing material. There was a little lady, I was able to build a house for her, not out of my pocket, but I would get help from um, different entities, different companies. Um, I would get help and we built a one bedroom house for old lady out there. And in um, 2011, I realized I was invited to a parent teachers meeting at the school out there. And because I was so helpful in the community, they would invite me to different things that is happening. And I went to the parent teachers meeting and there was one teacher who was, she got up and she spoke, but she was so overwhelmed with what she was facing, she began crying. She said, the children are lethargic, they are weak, they cannot participate in sports. Malnutritious. Um, they cannot participate and, and um, education and academically, they were way behind. And she recognized the reason why, because they never had enough nutrition. They never had nothing to eat. And sometimes they would have to take their lunch or take their little money to help to feed some of the children. And when I, I was there and I was listening and I never saw anybody got up and said, oh, well, Oh, I will give so much per month. I, I will give so much per week. I never heard anybody say that. So I went home heavy because I felt that this thing, it fell on me because it needed to be addressed. And I went home and I said, okay, Lord, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to do something but it's not me saying I'm going to do something. I'm being moved by my spirit, by the spirit in me to do something about it. I cannot do anything by myself. It is God that motivates us. It is God that speaks to us by his spirit. And so I was motivated to do a fish fry a fish fry where you buy the fish, you fry the fish, and you sell the fish. You sell the fry fish, you invite people to come in and play music, and the people come in and they um, purchase the fish. We made over 100,000, and we were able to give that to the school. But ask me how do I get into Bath? I was never from the area. I don't know anybody from the area. I remember I used to go with a friend of mine to bathe at the hot spring because Bath has a hot spring and it has a lot of minerals, you know, and it rejuvenates your body. It heals your body. And that is what I would go for. But not knowing anybody, after I finished, we would just drive and go back to Kingston. And the Lord said to me, go to Bath and have your birthday celebration in Bath. And I'm saying to myself, where out there can I go? And I asked a friend of mine, and he drove me. And he drove me, and I'm looking. While he's driving, I'm looking. And... I didn't see anywhere where we could have this party. <laughs> and I stopped, we stopped. And when we stopped, we were gonna ask some people, we saw some women gathered at one house. And the lady said, um, we asked her where we could have a party, a celebration. And she said, S the school, you could have the celebration at the school. But somebody said, but the principal is not here. She's overseas. And somebody else says, but she came back last night. And I went, long and short of it, I went to speak with her. And she said, we could use it. 
however, whenever. And so I was alternating a health fair. One year we would have a health fair where we get people, doctors from Kingston, um, different kind of doctors, geriatric, pediatric, you know, and um, people who deals with, deals with heart. We would um, get these doctors for free. They would give their render their services for free. And um, we would have a big gospel concert after that's done. And then the other year, we would also have a big gospel concert, but we would um, provide gift packages for the children and we would provide grocery items for the elderly. And that would be like a whole lot of people because it's Bath and the adjacent communities, you know. And um, that is it. So I'm still in the school. I'm still doing the, um, the breakfast program. When 2019, 2020, that's during COVID, and the kids couldn't, could not go to school, so they were doing school remotely. Um, we would get the grocery items and take it in, and they would meet us at the school and we issue, you know, because children cannot learn without nutrition, you know, and I find that when the children were being fed, their academical um, status grew. They took part in, in different sports activities and they won. They did so good. So what was missing was the nutrition. Um, yeah. All right. Not only that, we, you finish? Oh, not only that, we got a farm. We started a farm so the kids were able to participate in knowing how to grow bananas and cabbage and everything like that for the breakfast table. And we also got eggs. We got chickens and we got eggs and we rear these chickens. And so the eggs also went on the breakfast table. <clears throat> yeah. So we have to give back. I mean, that's how I survived. That's how I came up in life where others assisted me. And so I think each one should help the other. And, and this is my policy. And hence, that's why I do what I do. All right. Do you, do you have a message to give to the young sisters out there uh, watching? Well, I'd like to say to the, the young women especially that make your life before you make a new life because there are a lot of women and there's a lot of women being pregnant and they have no assistant from the men that they are pregnant for and they are left by themselves. But to get an education, it's very, very important to educate yourself so you don't have to be dependent on anyone and you are at a, in a position where you can help others. Because life is about not just you, it's about the other person. It's about helping your, your, your brother and your sister who are less fortunate than you are. So I believe that whatever you feel that you are called to do within yourself, pursue it. You know, you are not, some people, you, you're not a mistake. God didn't say, you, you may come out of a, a, a situation 
where you wish you could change your life around, you could change the situation from what it is. But I am saying that you are not a mistake. You are sent for a specific purpose. Everyone was sent on this earth for a particular purpose. And so I need you and you need me. I need what you're doing for me and you need what I have done for you. You know, we all need each other. I also am saying that there is a creator. We are not here by ourselves. We never came from monkey, as what we were told. There is a creator who carefully crafted us, fashioned us, and put us on this earth to fulfill his purpose and his sole purpose alone, to please him. Because we came here to please God. If he's the creator, the designer, the one that created us and put us here, then we should at all times be abreast to what he wants us to do. We need to know what is our purpose and we know we need to know that we are in alignment with our purpose and giving him glory at all times. It's not about me. It's never about me. I can't keep the breath in my lungs. When, when did you get to the point to understand, I think this is an important part most people don't get to in their life, when did you understand it's not about you? I understood, I mean, from I was a raster, I recognized that I was sent for a specific purpose. And because I know I'm sent for, I was always searching to find what is this purpose. And this purpose could not be for me living in a house and, and um, it's just me and my family. No, it's not just me and my family. It's the whole world is my family. You know, we are related and we need to take care of each other. But because this society that we live in, it's very selfish. You know, we are selfish and we believe this is for me and this is for me and my children and this is it's not for your mother, it's not for your father, it's not for your children. Your children are out there, hungry, dying, need support. And this is what the spirit in me is, is calling for. That we not only think about us, but we have to think about the other person that needs us. Everyone was born with gifts and talents. And that came from the Almighty God. And what I want to say that young ladies, just search within yourself because you already know, every one of us know. I knew when I was a child, I wanted to sing. I wanted to be a nurse. I never got a chance to be a nurse and I became a singer. And so I wanted to say that understand what is your gifting and go after what you feel in your spirit that you want to be. Sometimes we find ourselves doing things that because our parents want us to become this doctor or want to be an, a pilot but you just feel in your spirit that you wanted to be the best fisherman. You know, follow your dreams, follow your aspiration. It will not mislead you and fulfill your dreams. Everyone must dream because when your dream, dream does come true. I dreamt that I wanted to meet Rita Marley and Marcy Griffiths. I, want, I wanted to sing with them. That was a dream of mine. It never came to fruition. And one day, 
I was so surprised that it, it happened. So we don't sit down and mope and saying that this one don't allow me to do this. My mother never allowed me to do that. You can start anytime. In, 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 in the world today, technology, you know, you can, because of technology, you can know what. You can know how to go about what you want to do. If you want to be a nurse, you can go on your phone. You can look up. You can go on your phone and you can find out um, how can I find the opportunities. Opportunities are out there. Don't sit down and make it look as if you can't do this because of how you were born and how you were grown up by your parents because they didn't have it. And so I have to stay in this position. Launch out, pray. Because if God put that gift in you, then of course he wants to operate it. So pray and ask God to lead you in the right direction where your gifts and talents can be fulfilled. You know, people need us. All right. And I got to ask these two since we're vibing. How you keep the voice so strong? Your voice, with the singing voice after all this time. How do I? Well, um, how do I? I do vocal exercise. I do vocal exercise? Yes. All right. Because you have to do the exercises. Your muscles, your vocal cords are muscles. And those muscles do sag. Like you have to go to the gym to strengthen your, the muscles in your legs and in the rest of your body, you have to keep the vocal cords exercised and strengthened. And, and the last thing, obviously you saw the One Love movie, the Bob Marley movie. Mm -hmm. What were your thoughts about that? You I, I believe that the movie was, a lot of people would say that I mean, it's like controversy. People, people have this to say and people have that to say. But at the end of the day, it was something good. It was good for Jamaica because there is um, news. When you, when you talk about the travel, travel log or something like that, Jamaica is a place where it's banned, where people are told if you go to Jamaica, you can only go here, there, or not to go at all. This has shed a new light for Jamaica. This has done something so good for Jamaica. Um, Bob say you got tired for see my face. And I think this was one of the greatest thing could happen for the Marley dynasty. You know, um, Ziggy, Ziggy, and the rest of the family, they did, they did this. And I think Ziggy did this for his mom. Yeah, it seemed like a mother love story. Yes, that he did it for his mom. And I, wouldn't, I would say that some of it, everything is not as life was. It's not what it really is, but I think it is a great love story. Did they uh, reach out to you during pre-production? No. No? Mm -mm. So when did you find out about the movie? <laughs> I heard. I heard. All right. So all right, we'll put that to the side. Uh, in regards to the movie now, being that like, uh, you played an integral role in this historical experience than to see, see the movie, right? What is the most inaccurate thing that was presented, in your opinion? I want to tell you, I don't even want to talk about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, every day you go on social media. Without mix-up. No mix-up. I'm just saying, like, historically, yeah. things that, no, I'm not asking for no mix-up, but things that you say that kind of didn't really go like that or is a different presentation without getting into mix-up? 
Well, in um, without getting into mix yeah, up, it's not a mix up. Please. Um, there are certain part of Bob Marley's life, you know, is is love life. Some of some of those things were were not accurate. But as I say, I do not want to focus on that because when you go on social media, everybody is down crying this one and down crying that one. I want to be positive. I want to remain positive. I mean, as I said, there are certain things that is not what is because we were close to him. But for the rest of the world who love Bob Marley and don't know anything about his life or his lifestyle, you know, they just want to come to see who was this man. Because all they had was the music, but they want to come to see who was this man. And it paid off. Their, you know, whatever the intentions were, it paid off. So I want to stay on the positive side. I don't want to go into that. All right.